Hello and welcome everyone to this session on rapid revision of surgery part 9. My name is Dr. Janvi and I am going to be continuing with the series that we started last week. So all of you who have been following the series, you know we have covered esophagus, stomach, small intestine, swellings in surgery, thyroid, breast and um, the whole of uh, GIT and now we started uro. So in uro, we, yesterday we completed uh, almost three-fourths of kidney. Today we'll be doing the rest of kidney and the urinary bladder. So before we begin, I hope you guys are able to see me and hear me well. You can leave a thumbs up in the chat box and I will be able to see if the streaming is absolutely fine. Yes, all right. So I can see that the streaming is fine and you're able to hear me. So let's begin with the class for today. Um, this is the Telegram channel where we post all the links for our free classes. Now there are free classes available uh, for all subjects on uh, YouTube and trust me, you don't need anything else for your preparation if you just follow these classes sincerely and make your own notes and revise it towards the end. The plus subscription on Unacademy helps access to both live and recorded classes. You can learn from India's top educators and you can study on the device of your choice. The iconic subscription is a partnership between Unacademy and PrepLadder which will help you get the best of Unacademy's live lectures and PrepLadder's recorded lectures. Uh, I have also started taking an Unacademy Plus course. Um, it, it is the third day today. We are uh, doing anesthesia in six days. So if any of you all want to join the course, you can join it now. The special classes that we have are absolutely free of cost. You can come on the platform watch them you will be uh, reminded of when the class will be by a notification and also at the end of it you will get pdf lecture notes we also have a highly effective question bank that is available with 25000 plus questions these are our fmg toppers and on this sunday we have a very exciting test the need pg combat test which is there at 11 am and uh, i highly recommend all of you all to give the combat test this week um, we have anesthesia and the other short subjects and medicine and this will help you win prizes worth 10 lakh rupees and free an academy plus subscriptions we also have raise a hand option in our classes through which you can speak to the educator and ask about any of your doubts live and we also have these batches going on right now in plus. So the target need PG 2022 MCQ discussion batch and the focus FMG comprehensive batch. And these are the free tests available on the Unacademy app. And this is the batch that we have started target next integrated system wise batch 2023, which will have integration of multiple subjects. So this is our pricing plan for need PG subscription. And if you would like to join the Need PG subscription, you can use my code Dr. Janvi Live, with which you will get an extra 10% off on your subscription value. Uh, I have also curated an Unacademy Live quiz, which is free, freely available on the app. Here, I have basically asked you questions on GIT of surgery because we've covered that. So this is the code for that Unacademy Live quiz, 619516. And you can go through the quiz. And if you have any doubts, you can ask me. So, beginning with the first question for today, which of these is incorrect about Wim's tumor? It arises from embryonic connective tissue. It is located in one of the poles of the kidney. It is bilateral in 5% cases. It is common in the first 4 years of life. So, you have to tell me which of these is an incorrect statement. There is a googly over here. Melissa, I did not get your question. <clears throat> Does what come with a certificate? Okay. So, I can see that most of you all are very, very careful about answering. You are saying it is bilateral in more than 5% of the cases is the answer. Anyone, any other answers? Or do you think all the options that are here are correct? Anyone wants to give option D? All the options given above are correct. Okay guys, so this was why I was calling this a googly question for you all. So this question, all the options that are there over here are absolutely correct. Okay. 
so you i was expecting someone to say ma'am all the options feel fine but uh, we did not come up with that uh, teja kumar we are doing euro today so your wimps tumor yes it arises from embryonic connective tissue it contains epithelial elements as well as connective tissue uh, elements okay it is located in one of the poles of the kidney and it is bilateral in 5% of the cases and it is common in first 4 years of life okay so all of them are correct all of the above are correct okay so now moving on to discussing a little bit about wimps tumor so first of all they will ask you in the wimps tumor that what how does it look on gross pathology why am i asking you this question it will be given to you either as an image um, and you have to identify that it, it is wimps tumor and the second thing is it may be also given to you uh, like a question so there is a kidney that was removed and you see a dash 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 kind of mass that is present on one of the poles of the kidney okay so you should be able to identify the gross pathology so when you look at the wimps tumor it is um, it will be either on the upper pole or the lower pole correct it is a soft smooth fleshy pinkish white color tumor and inside the tumor it will have some hemorrhagic areas okay so it's soft it's smooth it's not like rcc in which you have irregular margins and you the tumor is dirty looking but here it it looks more like a part of the viscera only okay soft smooth fleshy and pinkish white in color with areas of hemorrhage in between right now next thing that they will ask you is microscopically what do you find in it so already mentioned over here it arises from the embryonic connective tissue so microscopically you will find epithelial elements you will find connective tissue elements and obviously whatever is the kidney is made up of like your primitive glomeruli and tubules all of those will be present okay but they will not be the normal structures they will be abnormal structures which are malignant in nature okay then next question they will ask in the exam this is a very important question how does the spread of wimps tumor take place and where does it spread mainly mainly spread of wimps tumor will come from where anyone okay so mainly the wimps tumor spreads through the blood you have through you have two three options for spread correct one will be direct invasion one will be blood one will be lymphatics so in wimps tumor the main spread is distant and the distant spread may takes place through the blood so the most common organ to which the spread takes place is nothing but the lungs i think someone has mentioned it over here yeah aruna nishi all of you all have mentioned it so the spread to the lungs is the most common uh, metastasis okay now next what are the clinical features that the child will present with so the question that they will give you is there is a 4 year old child or someone who is smaller than 4 years old and he presents with three characteristic feature in fact there is a triad of these features so can you tell me what does he present with what are those three characteristic features very good aruna so there will be an abdominal mass and that mass will mainly be in the loin okay if they specify where exactly in the loin and there will be pyrexia fever and hematuria excellent sole bature okay so these are our, the triad of symptoms the question that comes in the exam is what is the most common presentation out of the triad also what is the most common presentation out of lump fever and hematuria which is the most common presenting feature fever okay any other answers lump yes very good so abdominal mass is the most common presentation out of all three of them fever and hematuria will come later but mass is the most common presenting feature okay all right next question that they will ask is what are the investigations that you will do for a wimps tumor so remember whenever there is a tumor na uh, the best investigation to do is a ct scan because the ct scan will give you exactly the size of the tumor whether there is any local spread and if you want to see the malignant spread then you have to do a pet ct scan okay so ct scan is the best way to identify the tumor ct scan abdomen and kub 
and what will be the treatment treatment anyone okay it is a tumor you cannot let the tumor in the normal tissue otherwise it will grow and it will spread correct so you have to remove that side of the kidney so you will do a nephrectomy and post op to prevent the spread of the tumor or to take care of the metastasis you will give post op radiotherapy post op radiotherapy okay now my question for you guys is simple if there is a bilateral tumor i told you in 5% of the cases you will have a bilateral tumor can you remove both the kidneys and keep him for dialysis it's a 5 4 year old child can you keep him for dialysis for the next 70 years of his life or is there something else that we can do you can't do that correct so is there something else that can be done okay so remember you can do a partial nephrectomy so suppose this is the part where the tumor is there upper pole in both the kidneys so you do a nephron sparing surgery what is nephron sparing surgery nephron sparing surgery is nothing but another name for partial nephrectomy so you only remove the part which has the tumor and a good surrounding area margins around it and then later on just keep the uh, reviewing the patient again and again to see if there is any more growth okay obviously in some time in life the patient if he uh, undergoes a uh, renal failure he may require renal transplant but at least since the child is small for that point in time you are saving him by saving the remaining part of the kidney okay so you are doing a nephron sparing surgery in bilateral kidney partial nephrectomy in bilateral kidney all right so this is all that they ask about wimps tumor now the second thing that they will ask you is stoffer syndrome is seen in gravitz tumor hypernephroma rcc all of the above सब सही लग रहे हैं फिर से यस सो आई हैव ट्वीट अप द ऑप्शन अ लिटिल बिट फॉर यू गाइज सो एब्सोल्युटली करेक्ट सो ऑल ऑफ द अब इज द करेक्ट आंसर नाउ वॉट वॉज द कैच इन दिस क्वेश्चन ग्रावेस ट्यूमर हाइपरनेफ्रोमा आर सी सी आर ऑल नेम्स फॉर द सेम ट्यूमर ओके ऑल ऑफ देम आर डिफरेंट डिफरेंट नेम्स फॉर रीनल सेल कार्सिनोमा ओनली ओके so are there any other names for renal cell carcinoma that you need to know now remember this is a very common uh, question rcc so they will not ask you directly they will ask you through the other names it is also called as a clear cell carcinoma because that is the most common variant and the other name that is there for it is also a internist tumor internist tumor okay so these are all the four five names of renal cell carcinoma that you should know about the questions that are asked in the exam what is the microscopic appearance of renal cell carcinoma next is what is the most common site of renal cell carcinoma then what is the age group in which you will find renal cell carcinoma mostly and what are the variants when you look at it microscopically but what is the most common site okay first of all it is an adenocarcinoma theek okay? hai no in when i am asking you about the site i basically what i am asking you is whether it is present in the glomerulus proximal convoluted tubule distal convoluted tubule or collecting duct or loop of henle where exactly is it present what is the common age group what is the most common microscopic variant so chole bature has answered one question correctly so the most common microscopic variant is the clear cell variant correct clear cell variant uh, 75% of them are clear cell variant and you also have other variants like papillary and chromophobe variant chromophobe and collecting duct of bellini so if they ask you in the exam which is the most common variant clear cell will be the most common variant and if they ask you which is the most rare variant so your collecting duct of bellini will be the most rare variant okay yeah 
yes absolutely correct so your proximal convoluted tubule is the most common site where the tumor occurs what is the most common age group in which it occurs most common age group yes so most common age group so it occurs between 50 to 60 years of life 5 to 6 decade of life and then the question that comes is which variant single liner questions okay which variant is familial which variant is due to chromosomal loss and or abnormality and the third question that they will ask is which variant has the best prognosis these are all one liners that come in rcc that you should be aware about very good manali so chromophobe variant has the best prognosis which variant is familial and which variant is uh, a, uh, due to a chromosomal abnormality papillary variant is not familial no that's incorrect okay so both familial as well as chromosomal abnormality both are seen in the clear cell variant only both are seen in clear cell variant okay now what chromosomal abnormality do you see so you see a abnormality in the short arm of chromosome 3 so when i'm saying there is a chromosomal abnormality is there any syndrome that the clear cell variant of rcc would be associated with you know of any syndrome syndrome associated with rcc next question very good teja kumar so it is nothing but von hippel lindau syndrome okay so in von hippel lindau syndrome what all do you see so you will see in cerebellar angiomatosis then you will also see retinal hemangioblastoma so i'm trying to draw eyes over here so if you see a patient of rcc and there is a family history you should also be looking for all of these things okay and in the pancreas you will see presence of cysts so pancreatic cysts and you will also see rcc Barabar? these are the four or five things that you will be able to see in von hippel lindau syndrome okay now we discussed the most common site was the proximal convoluted tubule and many of you all mentioned that the most convoluted site was also the most uh, common site was also the upper pole of the kidney that is also absolutely correct okay <coughs> okay now grossly how does this tumor look so grossly how was the wim's tumor looking it was soft fleshy smooth with some areas of hemorrhage in between okay if you look at rcc grossly it is a yellowish color tumor any idea why it should be yellowish color and then it has areas of hemorrhage and necrosis in between so it's a very dirty tumor when you cut it from inside but any idea why it is yellowish in color your rcc was having a very nice sorry your wilms tumor was having a very nice soft pinkish color but this one over here is yellowish because of urine no but good idea bile no okay it's because it has a large amount of fat in it okay because of the large amount of fat it is yellowish in color all right now next question they will ask you how does the spread of rcc take place now remember this is a very very vascular tumor i told you there are three methods of spread always so you have local spread which will be by direct extension you will have lymphatic spread and you will also have vascular spread correct so now tell me local spread takes place to what lymphatic spread takes place to what and vascular spread takes place to what okay so local spread takes place to the remaining parts of the kidney okay so it will go into the renal calysis it will go into the renal pelvis 
and more importantly if this is your kidney around the kidney you will have perinephric fat remember yesterday we discussed your perinephric abscess will develop in this perinephric fat okay so the local spread will also take place to that perinephric fat okay then lymphatic spread it will obviously take place to the surrounding lymph nodes so what are the surrounding lymph nodes in that area you I, the aorta is present right over there the kidney is on either side of the aorta so your para aortic lymph nodes is where the lymphatic spreads will take place okay and the third thing is the most important one that is asked in the exam so where does the vascular spread take place so remember this your renal cell carcinoma can easily go through the renal vein and through the renal vein it will get it will go to all the different parts of the body especially to the lung so when you see the metastasis in the lung it is a very characteristic appearance if this is your lung over here as it it look coin shaped in nature can anyone tell me the name of this Yes, Gerota's fascia is a capsule of the kidney. Very good, Teja Kumar. So, this appears as coin shaped and it is also called as cannonball secondaries. Okay. So, in your exam, the question that they will ask is cannonball secondaries in the lung come from where? So, you should know that it comes from renal cell carcinoma. Okay. Cannonball secondaries. All right. So, this is all the areas where you have the spread of the uh, tumor RCC. And then they will ask you about the staging. So, since I don't have another page, I'll just write it over here. One second. So, staging of RCC, there is a peculiar name. Does anyone know the staging of RCC? Does anyone know the staging of RCC? Okay. So, for your exam, you only need to remember the name. It is called as Robson Flock Staging. Okay, Robson Flox and Kadiski staging. That is the name of the staging. Now, it's very easy. You have stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and stage 4. So, you have to remember stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and stage 4 as per the spread away from the kidney. Okay, so if you look at the kidney over here, stage 1 will be when it spreads to the renal parenchyma only. Okay, so that will be your stage 1. Now, in stage 2, it will go in the surrounding fat. So, this is the perinephric fat. So, the tumor will spread to the surrounding fat. I am drawing around the upper pole only. Then, in stage 3, it will go further away. So, where will it go further away? Imagine this is your renal vein. So, in stage 3, it starts going into the renal vein or into the IVC. Okay. So, now it is going to go as a cannonball secondary. Okay. And... What is stage 4? Obviously, once it has gone to the renal vein, it can spread to distant spread, to distant organs, okay? So, stage 4 will be when there is distant spread. And stage 4 has one more organ that is involved and that is your adrenals. So, the adrenals are here on top. So, if it spreads to the adrenal glands, it will become stage 4 also, okay? Now, there is one more classification, uh, TNM classification given by AGCC, American Society of Cancer Care. So, uh, that also has to be done but those classifications are the ones that I'll be making mnemonics of and I will be putting here on the channel itself okay so I'm not going to discuss that now because I'll make a mnemonic for that and I'll put it up on the channel but remember this Robson and Kadiski staging because this is one of the very easy stagings to remember in your exam they are not going to ask you ki, what is the stage 1 stage 2 stage 3 stage 4 but just for your information I have sort of updated you all about it okay jole bature uh, tnm staging absolutely correct it is the one that is most commonly used now and mainly you need to remember that only but kabhi koi exam may if inict or some exam they tend to ask you some difficult question to see whether people have read the textbook or no okay so this is the question that they will ask what is this uh, staging used for uh, so, you should know that Robson and Kadiski staging is used for RCC and it is a very easy staging. So, it's not very difficult to remember also. Just remember this, this picture and visually you will be able to remember it. Okay. If you can't remember the staging, it's absolutely fine. Just remember the name of the scientist who founded the staging. All right. Now, next question. What are the symptoms that a patient with RCC will present with? What is the triad of symptoms in RCC? 
just like we have triad of symptoms in just like we have triad of symptoms in wimps tumor you have to tell me triad of symptoms in rcc gross hematuria very good if can you tell me whether this hematuria will be painless or painful very good teja kumar so very similar to the triad of symptoms in wimps tumor only instead of fever you are having pain over here okay so instead of fever you are having pain fever was there in wimps tumor we have pain over here and the patient will have palpable renal mass and gross hematuria okay so this is our triad of symptoms in rcc all right okay now the next thing oh we forgot to discuss this guys uh, the question was about stoffer syndrome what is stoffer syndrome any idea what is stoffer syndrome okay so in a patient who has rcc it is seen that sometimes he will present with liver dysfunction so people started thinking that this liver dysfunction is probably because of meds is it because of meds no so this is a non metastatic liver dysfunction that takes place in case of rcc and once you do the nephrectomy in rcc it gets corrected on its own okay so it is non metastatic liver dysfunction in a case of rcc which gets corrected on its own after nephrectomy okay but right. now next one how will you investigate this tumor what are the investigations that you will do for this any idea i told you if there is any tumor in the body the best investigation is ct of the abdomen or ct of that site so this will basically tell you where what is the size of the tumor and where all it has invaded whether it has invaded the renal vein whether it has invaded the ivc you will be able to make out in this okay so that is the best way to identify the tumor and sometimes they say you can do a urine routine microscopy and you can look for rbcs so if you see there is hematuria microscopic hematuria you should start thinking of this all right okay now what is the treatment treatment is also very easy just like wimps tumor if there is a tumor over here you have to remove the entire kidney okay so nowadays they say that there is no need to remove the entire kidney if your mass is only here on the upper pole you can do a partial nephrectomy same as i told you in bilateral case of wimps tumor so this partial nephrectomy is called as nephron sparing surgery so what are you doing you are sparing all the normal nephrons which are below and the kidney can continue to function so that is called as nephron sparing surgery okay so what all other things that you remove so you will remove the entire kidney uh, so you will remove the part of the kidney which has the tumor then you will also remove the surrounding perinephric tissue because maybe the tumor spread would have already taken place over there you will remove the adrenal gland on that side because it's very close to the tumor and you will remove a part of the ureter if it's close to the ureter you will remove a little part of the ureter if it's not close from the ureter you can save it and along with it you will remove the lymph nodes now what all has to be removed you don't need to remember you just need to remember that we do a nephron sparing surgery for the treatment of mems tumor okay clear for for the treatment of rcc so this is all about rcc that you guys needed to know all the one line of questions that they ask what are the variants what is stoffer syndrome what are uh, what is vhl that is associated with this what is the gross appearance of the tumor and microscopic appearance of the tumor how does the tumor spread and the staging and the symptoms investigations and treatment theek okay? hai बस इतना ही याद रखना है अबाउट आर सी सी नाउ लेट्स मूव ऑन टू आवर नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन एक्सटर्नल यूरेथ्रल स्पिंक्टर इज इनोवेटेड बाय वेगस नर्व पुडेंडल नर्व हाइपोकैस्टिक प्लेक्सिस और सिंपथेटिक सेगमेंट्स एस थ्री एंड एस फोर okay so most of you all have answered it as c and most of you all are wrong about it 
I can't see any correct answer over here. Does anyone want to take a change in their answer? Okay, <clears throat> no one wants to change their wrong answer also. So the correct answer over here is B pudendal now. Yes, absolutely correct. Okay. So can anyone tell me? You have two sphincters. You have internal urethral sphincter. And you have the external urethral sphincter. Barabar. So out of both of these, can you tell me which one is voluntary and which one is involuntary? And what is the innovation of both? Manali is saying kaha tha mene. Very good Moazam. So the external urethral sphincter is voluntary and your internal urethral sphincter is involuntary. Okay. So if the internal urethral sphincter is involuntary, it will be supplied by what? It will be supplied by autonomic nervous system. And if the external urethral sphincter is voluntarily, this will be supplied by pudendal nerve. Autonomic nervous system is not under our own control and that's why it is an involuntary sphincter. Alright. Okay. <clears throat> now, since we were talking about the sympathetic segments S3 and S4, I just wanted you guys to remember that the nerve root value of pudendal nerve is S2 and S3. So, if someone asks you what are the nerve roots that supply the sphincters, urethral sphincter, especially the external urethral sphincter, it is S2, S3. Alright. Okay. So, now we will move on to little bit about the, there is no place only to write. So, we will move on to the anatomy of the bladder and what is the vascular supply of the bladder, vascular and nervous supply. Before starting off any kind of uh, organ, I will always make you, make sure I will do a little bit of the anatomy and the questions that are asked regarding it. Okay. So, the first question that they ask is, what is the urothelium or what is the epithelium that the urinary bladder is made up of? The second question that they will ask is, what is the site of opening of the ureters into the urinary bladder? These are direct questions that have come in the exam and that's why I'm asking you. So, what is the epithelium that the urinary bladder is made up of? What is it called? Special, yeah, very good Teja Kumar. So, it is called as transitional cell epithelium. Okay, and that's why you have transitional cell carcinoma in this case. The second question that they will ask is, site of opening of ureter in the urinary bladder. What exactly is the site of opening? Okay, so remember this. This is a very easy thing to remember. If this is my urinary bladder, my urinary bladder has a small triangular area that is present on the lower end and this small triangular area is called as the trigone okay so at the base of this trigone there will be two openings these two openings are for the ureters and at the apex of the trigone there will be another opening and this opening is for my urethral sphincter or this is for my urethra okay so, your trigone basically has all the three openings for both the ureters as well as the urethra. So, that's what you need to remember. Okay. Uh, okay. Next thing, question asked, what is the blood supply of urinary bladder? So, what is the artery and what is the venous drainage? But And last, we will do the lymphatics. Okay. So, when we look at the blood supply of urinary bladder, you just need to remember the internal iliac artery and the internal iliac vein. Okay. Your internal iliac artery and internal iliac vein are the main blood supply. Now, out of this also, if you want to remember exactly which artery supply, 
so the superior vesical artery superior vesical artery is a branch of the internal iliac artery okay and the vesical plexus of veins vesical plexus of veins drains into the internal iliac vein so it's very easy bladder hai to anything with the term vesical will help you identify what is the supply of the uh, bladder okay then what about the lymphatics in that area we are talking about internal iliac artery and internal iliac vein so the lymphatics over there also will be the internal iliac lymph nodes okay so this is your supply for the urinary bladder simple okay next question most common malignant transformation in exostrophy of bladder is transitional cell carcinoma adenocarcinoma squamous cell carcinoma or melanoma okay so most common malignant transformation in exostrophy of bladder is it's not squamous cell what is the correct answer no not transitional cell so now you are left with only two options adeno or melanoma transitional cell carcinoma is the most common type of urinary bladder tumor absolutely correct but exostrophy of bladder does not lead to malignant transformation to transitional cell carcinoma it is adenocarcinoma very good muism okay so most common malignant transformation in exostrophy is adenocarcinoma now let's have a look about exostrophy of bladder because this comes in both pediatrics as well as in surgery so what happens in exostrophy of bladder what is the problem if this is your abdomen the lower part of the abdomen the infra umbilical part can you see this is the umbilicus the infra umbilical part of the abdominal wall will not be developed two things are not developed one is the infra umbilical part of the abdominal wall and the second thing is the anterior wall of the bladder so the bladder lies just below okay so anterior wall of bladder that is the one which is also urinary bladder that is also what is not developed so as a result of this what are you seeing you are seeing the bladder coming outside through the abdominal defect okay the, the child will be born with this defect only so you also have to look for other defects that are associated with this so the question that comes in the exam what are the other defects associated with this and the next is what are the complications of this disease yes this is also called as ectopia vesicae because the bladder is coming out exostrophy of bladder or ectopia vesicae no abdominal wall defect and anterior wall defect is the structural defect that takes place in exostrophy of bladder any other conditions that are associated with it not vagus syndrome you have spina bifida that is associated with it okay so the defect will not be just in the abdominal wall but also behind in the vertebra in spina bifida you have defect in the vertebra so the you will see there is uh, you can see the spinal cord clearly from there from the vertebral defect okay all right and what are the complications that will be associated with it now remember the bladder is outside so the most common complication that can occur are two one is renal failure because of obstruction and uh, hydronephrosis and hydrourator the second thing is infection of the bladder which is outside correct now along with that there will be ulceration of the bladder because the mucosa is exposed outside and sometimes as i told you you can also have malignant transformation of the bladder so malignant transformation of the bladder takes place to adenocarcinoma okay most of the patients do not survive because they die of renal failure so almost 50% of the patients die of renal failure in this case okay any uh, idea about the surgical treatment of this um, disease okay so it's very easy what you do is what is the problem first now your ureters are also not able to drain easily into the urinary bladder 
so renal failure is what the child can die of immediately okay so what you do is first thing you have to do is you have to divert the ureter so you do urinary diversion now where do you divert the ureter where can the urine empty the urine can empty into the colon so you do a urinary diversion into the colon then the next thing that you do is now you start closing the defects okay so you close your defects you close the anterior abdominal wall you close the anterior wall of the urinary bladder and you push the urinary bladder inside so that is what you do in this case and then again you transpose the ureters which you are transposed to the colon back to the urinary bladder okay so this is how you manage a case of exostrophy of bladder or ectopia vesicae so these are all the questions that they will ask you about the same moving on to our next question most common organism leading to urinary tract infection and bladder stone formation is klebsiella proteus e coli pseudomonas Okay, Teja is saying C, E. coli. Any other answers? Proteus. There is always a confusion between these two. Okay. So the correct answer over here is E. coli. Most common organism leading to a urinary tract in, uh, infection and bladder stone formation is E. coli. Okay. Any idea what type of stone is formed in infected urine? What type of stone is formed in infected urine? Yeah, I have marked E. coli only. Yes, very good Moazam, a very good Chole Bhature. So, the most common type of stone that is formed in infected urine is nothing but triple phosphate. Okay. All right. So, now let's have a look at bladder stones because yesterday we saw the renal stones, correct? So, now we have to look a little bit into bladder stones. Okay. So, you have two types of bladder stones. One is called as a primary stone and one is called as a secondary stone. Any idea what is the difference between primary and secondary stone? Where are both of these stones forming? Any idea about it? Okay. So, your primary stone that is there, it basically comes down from the kidney to the ureter to the bladder. So, either I will draw it for you all, so it will become easy to remember. Okay. So, your primary stone is already there in the kidney or it is there in the ureter. So, it is coming down from your kidney to your ureter to your bladder. Okay. On the other hand, your secondary stone is formed in the urinary bladder. So, your secondary stone formation takes place in the bladder. Okay. So, that is why I was asking you what is the most common type of UTI because if you have, a, if you have cystitis in this acidic urine, you will have formation of a triple phosphate stone. So, this is the best example of a secondary stone because in case of that acidic environment and infected environment, you will have crystallization of triple phosphate and formation of the stones okay all right now the next thing that they so if triple phosphate stone is uh, forming as a secondary calculus what can be the primary calculus all your other calculi calcium oxalate monohydrate calcium oxalate dihydrate all of them are your primary stones okay all right then the next thing that they ask in the exam is what are the different types of stones what are the different types of crystals so everyone knows about those stones hexagonal stones are cysteine stones then you have uric acid stones needle shaped crystals uh, everyone knows about those you don't want me to uh, continue discussing those correct because yesterday only we did those dumbbell shaped crystals and uh, envelope shape coffin lid shape sab ho gaya hai kal. so i'm not going to discuss it again for those who don't know about it you can watch yesterday's class okay okay then we have the clinical features that the patient will present with. So now remember the clinical features of a stone in kidney was different because you were having mainly pain over there, loin to groin pain because of the stretching of the renal parenchyma, stretching of the ureter. But here the bladder has a lot of space in it. So here pain will be there. Yes, of course. But more than pain, you will have other symptoms. Any idea what are the other symptoms?
very good staphylococcus so the other symptoms that are available are urgency okay yes absolutely correct so it is nothing but urgency of urine so there will be urgency and increased frequency of urine why so this is your urinary bladder and this is the stone so the stone will keep irritating the wall of the urinary bladder so as a result of irritation of wall of the urinary bladder again and again the bladder will go into contraction or spasm so the patient will feel like passing urine but when he goes to pass urine there won't be anything because there isn't much urine that is there in the bladder okay so there will be frequency of urine and the second thing is there will be urgency of urine and there will also be pain in the um, pain that will be present but one uh, a thing very proper thing about pain that you need to remember is this pain is referred somewhere okay so where is the pain referred the pain is referred to the penis or the labia okay now i'll give you one easy thing to remember yesterday i forgot to tell you so you have referred pain in case of ureteric stone so you have to know where is your ureteric stone present so if the stone is present in the upper part of the ureter or in the kidney then your referred pain will be somewhere near the McBurney's point. You know the McBurney's point now, you draw a line from ASIS to umbilicus and divide it into lateral one third and medial two third. So that point between medial two third and lateral one third is the McBurney's point. Okay. So the upper part of the ureter stone will have referred pain to McBurney's point. If you have a stone in the middle part of the ureter, then you are going to have pain in the labia scrotum labia or penis okay and if you have a stone in the lower part of the ureter then you are going to have pain referred to the thigh inner part of the thigh medial part of the thigh okay so this is one of the important things that you need to remember for your exam other than pain urgency and frequency because of irritation of the stone you can also have hematuria and that's it how will you investigate the stone Everyone knows investigation, the best way to identify a stone is by doing an ultrasonography, correct? And the second thing, if you, why is ultrasonography more important? Again, I had touched upon this yesterday, is because if you take an x-ray, you say, no ma'am, I will try to locate the stone on x-ray. Of course, you will be able to see the bladder stone, but there are 90% of the stones are radiopic, but 10% of them will be radiolucent. So, on the x-ray, you will not be able to see the radiolucent bladder stones, okay? So as a result of this, this ultrasound is the one that will come into play in that picture. You will be able to see radio opaque, radio lucent, whatever stone is there, it will be echogenic and it will uh, reflect the echoes of the ultrasound and you will be able to locate the stone. Okay. So this is investigation of choice will be ultrasound and you can also do a urine culture sensitivity, especially if you feel that there is infected urine and that's why there is formation of stone. Okay. Treatment anyone? Yesterday we saw for uh, the treatment ESWL, PCNL. So can you do anything else than those for bladder stones? Cranberry juice helps a lot. Yes. Okay. So there are two things that you can do in case of a bladder stone. These are specifically for a bladder stone. So, first one is called as cystoscopic litholapexy. Cystoscopic litholapexy. And the second one is called as suprapubic cystolithotomy. Abhi, I don't know if you guys will understand from the names or no. But I'll tell you very simple. Suprapubic cystolithotomy. What are you doing? You are creating cystotomy, correct? So, you are creating a hole in the bladder by suprapubic approach this is your stone that is present so what will you do in the upper part of the urinary bladder you create a hole and then you put instruments and you retrieve the stone directly so that is called as suprapubic cystolithotomy okay then the next option is cystoscopic litholapexy so what do you do in cystoscopic litholapexy you are doing cystoscopy you are doing bladder endoscopy correct so this is your bladder from here you pass the litho cystoscope imagine this is your stone you pass the 
cystoscope from here then you break down the stone you break down the stone into many many fragments once the fragments are present then you do an irrigation of the bladder so you irrigate the bladder so that those fragmented parts go out okay so this is how you will take care of a bladder stone those two specific ways of managing a bladder stone cystoscopic litholapaxy and suprapubic open cystolithotomy okay all right okay next one which of these is a causative agent for this disease e coli cystitis tb bladder chemical carcinogens or contrast use chalo we have only 10 minutes left and we quickly have to finish two topics so answer quickly Yes. So, what can you see over here? Is there anything that does not look normal over here? Can you see the urinary bladder over here? This is actually the bladder which has a contrast in it. Okay. So, the bladder is very small in size. So, this is nothing but thimble bladder. Thimble bladder. Any idea what is the meaning of thimble? <laughs> yeah, that is the small size bladder. Okay. And thimble bladder is seen in which condition? You all have to tell me. Now, what uh, I wanted to tell you guys is uh, what is the meaning of thimble? Okay, so uh, when when you s go to a place where people sew clothes, okay, sew so means silai, stitching of clothes, okay. So the needle can hurt their finger while they are sewing clothes. So in order to protect the needle, what they do is they put a cap. So that cap is called as thimble, okay. So basically they say that the urinary bladder is the size of the cap that you put on top of the thumb. So it is so small in size so that is why we call it as thimble bladder okay now what uh, uh yeah okay so staphylococcus correct answer tb is one of the reasons for thimble bladder absolutely correct so now uh let's discuss about thimble bladder so what is the problem with thimble bladder the bladder is small in size it is fibrotic and it is contracted so if your bladder is small in size what will be the problem it will not hold as much amount of urine as you want so the bladder will you will have increased frequency of urine correct they say that the bladder capacity is very very less it is less than 100 ml in nature what are the main clinical features that a thimble bladder will present with since the bladder has no holding capacity no distending capacity there will be increased frequency of urine and since the patient is going to the toilet again and again the patient will have sorry since the patient is going to the toilet again and again he will have increased chance of urinary tract infection okay then what are the investigations by which you can identify a thimble bladder it's very easy you can just put a scope inside and you can check the size of the bladder so you can do a cystoscopy and you can see the size of the bladder okay then what are the causes of thimble bladder so i have discussed with you over here only tb of the bladder correct any other organisms that you know can cause thimble bladder there is one um, parasite that comes in the exam okay our uh, post radiotherapy or after a tumor if you have removed pa part of the urinary bladder you've done a partial cystectomy you can have this okay just like tb even schistosomiasis of the bladder can cause thimble bladder okay and what will be the treatment in case of thimble bladder? Nothing. Treatment, if you have TB or if you have schistosomiasis, you have to treat the cause. If it's post radiotherapy or post malignancy, then you may have to create a new bladder. Okay, so you may have to create a neo bladder. Where do you create a neo bladder from? You remove this small chotosa thimble bladder and you do a cystectomy and then you take a part of the sigmoid colon and you can make a new bladder itself okay so you can take any part of the sigmoid colon and make a new bladder so that is called as sigmoidocystoplasty okay so those are all the treatments you can do you can even try to dilate the small bladder if it dilates and increases its retaining capacity so that is all about thimble bladder okay 
and the last topic for today that we will be doing is this which of these drugs are used in intravesical chemotherapy for bladder cancer mitomycin c bcg epirubicin or all of the above we are going to discuss bladder carcinoma okay manali is saying bcg any other Okay, Chore Bature is saying all of the above, mitomycin, muazam, Rita is also saying D. Yes, so the correct answer is D, all of the above. Now, I know most of you all know about BCG, but many of you all may not know about the other options also. Okay, so it is actually all of the above, mitomycin, BCG, epirubicin, all of them are used in intravesical chemotherapy. Okay, so now we are going to discuss the most common type of bladder cancer. Can anyone tell me what is the most common type of bladder cancer? We discussed in the beginning when I told you the epithelium. Yes, it is nothing but transitional cell carcinoma. Transitional cell carcinoma. Okay. Can anyone tell me the causative factors for bladder cancer? Etiology of bladder cancer. This comes in the exam. That's why. Yes, very good. So, there are three important things that you need to remember for the exam. These are called as the three C's of causative factors of bladder carcinoma. Okay. So, one is cigarette smoking. Second is chemical carcinogens. All your dyes, uh, textile industry, all of those people are prone to bladder cancer. And three is cyclophosphamide. Okay. So, they are called as the three C's which are the causative organism of bladder cancer. Okay. Now, what are the types of bladder cancer that you see? So, you may have either a superficial bladder tumor. So when you have a superficial bladder tumor, that will just be like a polyp. It will look more like a polyp. It will be pedunculated and it can easily be removed. It will just be in the, just uh, be going up to the mucosa. Okay. And the wall the worst type is a muscle invasive type so the muscle invasive type will spread to all layers of the muscularis of the bladder okay so the third type that we have is the carcinoma in situ where only the epithelial lining of the bladder will be affected okay so superficial type muscle invasive type and carcinoma in situ these are the three types of bladder tumor that we have okay then you have the staging again AGCC staging as I told you I will take it up as a mnemonic all the stagings now I will take them up as mnemonic and put them up on YouTube for you guys so that you all can watch it later then the clinical features anyone any idea how a patient with bladder cancer will present how will a patient with bladder cancer present will he have okay first you all tell me what he'll have then I'll ask you the question Yes, yes, very good, Chole Bature. So, there will be painless hematuria. Remember, cancer is always associated with no pain, most of the cases, okay, except in your RCC. Remember, in RCC, pain was one of the important clinical features in the triad because of stretching of the capsule because of the mass, okay. So, there will be painless hematuria that will be present. Anything else? Okay. So, because of the presence of a mass in the urinary bladder, the mass will irritate the urinary bladder. So, if it irritates the urinary bladder, there will be constant contraction of the bladder. So, there will be increased frequency of urination and there will be dysuria and the patient can also have recurrent inflammation of the bladder. So, cystitis can be present. Okay. The third thing is if the mass in the urinary bladder obstructs the ureteric opening, if it obstructs one-sided ureteric opening, you will have one-sided hydro ureter and hydronephrosis. 
if it obstructs bilateral which is not much possible because it will be a very large mass then in that case you will have bilateral hydro ureter or hydro nephrosis okay so that is how the presentation will be then what are the investigations i will write it down over here investigations and treatment okay so in the investigations what will you do easiest investigation for, uh, that you can do and most cost effective and one of the first investigations is you can do a urine microscopy so on urine microscopy what will you find you will find microscopic hematuria that is present you will see rbc's per high power field okay the second thing that you can do is you can also do a cystoscopy this is one of the best investigations to be done because here you can see the size of the tumor you can see this local spread of the tumor and you can also stage the tumor and the best part about it is you can take a biopsy so cystoscopy and biopsy is the investigation of choice if you don't have uh, a urosurgeon who can carry out cystoscopy and biopsy you can even do an ultrasound or a ct scan whatever is available to see how much is the extension of the tumor okay then last will be the treatment of the tumor so treatment of the tumor you have two important treatments so first thing is suppose it is just a superficial tumor i showed you over here the superficial type and it is not invading much into the muscle okay so for a superficial tumor what will you do and for an invasive tumor what will you do invasive tumor ka to bahut easy hai you have no option it has invaded deep into the muscle and it can spread to the surrounding adjacent organs and also have distance spread so you have to do a radical cystectomy theek okay? hai you have to remove the entire urinary bladder and in place of the urinary bladder you create an ileal conduit okay so you take a part of the ileum and that ileum will form the new bladder okay so you have removed the urinary bladder now you have to put the ureters into the new bladder that is formed from the part of the ileum that you have taken so that is called as radical cystectomy ileal conduit okay and along with that you can also give radiotherapy to the patient after surgery now if it is a superficial tumor you can do something which is called as t u r b t okay i'll tell you the full form of t u r b t trans urethral resection of bladder tumor so this is very similar to doing a cystoscopy you pass a, a cystoscope and then you remove that part of the bladder tumor that is present and then you give intravesical bcg or any of those drugs that i mentioned before for chemotherapy intravesical bcg mitomycin epirubicin all of them or any of them can be given most commonly we give bcg only okay so this is how you manage a superficial and an invasive urinary bladder tumor okay yeah like in pros benign prostatic hypertrophy we do top so in this case we you we do turbt okay so that's it about bladder tumor so today's class we have completed the entire uh, portion that is required for kidney and bladder we have a little bit of prostate left and um, then we'll have to finish off large intestine from git large intestine and rectum anal canal i think in another four five classes we should be able to complete surgery but from tomorrow onwards i will be taking classes on the special class platform an academy platform special class platform they are freely available for all of you all you just have to put my code dr janvi live to enter into those classes and you will be able to attend them i will try to keep the timing at 10 am in the morning tomorrow i am planning to take an ecg revision and quiz for you guys and also an x-ray revision and quiz for you guys for most commonly asked x-rays in the exam and uh, i hope to see you guys on the platform uh, is 10 o'clock okay guys 10 am because uh, in the afternoons i have 4 to 6 plus sessions tomorrow we'll be doing ecg and x-ray so let me know if 10 o'clock is okay for you for most of you all or we can even keep it in the evening at 8 o'clock or something like that in 11 am there is already classes 11 and 12 15 by another educator so that's why i'm trying to not clash with everyone yeah 
ठीक है सो वॉट आई डू इज आई एल कीप अ शॉर्ट क्लास एट टेन ई एम एंड देन आई ट्राई टू कीप अ शॉर्ट क्लास एट एट पी एम सो वेन एवर यू गाइज कैन कम यूल कैन कम डोंट फर्गेट टू यूज द कोड डॉक्टर जानवी लाइव वेन यू एंटर इन टू एनी ऑफ द फ्री क्लासेस सो आई सी यू गाइज नेक्स्ट टाइम टिल देन कीप स्टडिंग बाय बाय